The death of George Floyd was a catalyst that's led to widespread protests and even more extreme reactions. Discussions and feelings about racism, systemic injustice, and the role of the police have been on our minds and in our conversations. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, one of the pastors of St. James Lutheran Church in West St. Paul, Minnesota, and we're here at Light the Way Church in Cottage Grove. And I'm hoping that our discussion today can offer some light and hope in the midst of these discussions. Introduce yourself. I'm Sergeant Valerie Naiman. I'm retired from the St. Paul Police Department. I was a police officer for 27 years. I had seven years with Hennepin County Sheriffs and 20 years with St. Paul Police. I was a police sergeant in traffic investigations for six years prior to retiring a year and a half ago. My name is Eric Morgan. I'm a area director for Treehouse in District 833. We are at the Alley Church in Cottage Grove, Minnesota. I've been an area director for several years now, and I'm just here to uh, help shed light on some of the situations that's going on in our states right now. All right, so t before we started this, I asked for uh, questions to be submitted so that we could know what people are thinking about and, and, uh, and what they're wondering as they're seeing the news and seeing things on social media and all that. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read through those questions and give our panelists a chance to answer them. All right, so we'll start out with the first one. I think this is one I hear uh, really often in various ways. People keep saying black lives matter. Don't all lives matter? Is that racist against the police or against white people? Well, I think what they're saying, at least how I interpret it, is it's not so much that a specific race, but that, in fact, all lives do matter, but when they're saying black lives matter, it's to bring awareness to the fact that uh, black people as a race have been marginalized as we know in history as a disposable race. And it's a movement to help bring awareness to the injustices that have been done and to bring awareness to what needs to be done so that everybody is in fact treated equally. I agree with you. I feel that the, the statement Black Lives Matter and the movement is something that's helped our culture. It's helped me as a black person to have something to look upon, to have something to rely on. And it's not that we're saying other lives don't matter and other races don't matter, but as we're seeing in the world, as we've seen over and over again, black lives have been some of the ones that have been discriminated for centuries and centuries. And at this point in time, we need to pay close attention to that race because that's the race that a lot of deaths are coming, a lot of false adjustments are going on in the race, and it's just something to be aware of. I don't find it racist for saying black lives matter. And I'm not walking around going, I don't care about any other race but mine. But I'm saying right now, black lives is a, is, is a race that we need to pay close attention to. And we need to change the narrative. And we need to do something about some of the injustices that are going on in the black culture. Okay. So it's sort of a, it's not only black lives matter, but it's like, hey, black lives matter too. Absolutely. Exactly. Okay. So what is the percentage of arrests for each of the races in St. Paul? Okay, um, we've never really kept track of what percentage is from what background have been arrested. We used to do for, we used to do something similar to that when we did traffic stops and when we completed a traffic stop, we had to list the race. We had to list whether they were cited or not cited, arrested or not arrested. Um, and that was part of a large study that went on through the city of St. Paul. And unfortunately, um, they looked at the stats for the off different officers and came back that a lot of our officers were under their classification listed as being racist because of the number of minorities they had tagged, arrested, et cetera. But they didn't take in effect the demographics because under their standards, 
I was racist towards black people. Okay. <laughs> and, but they didn't look at the fact that I worked in Frogtown, which is primarily black and Hmong. So 90% of my contacts are either going to be black and Hmong. So they had the good intention, but they didn't take it far enough to look at the demographics of where all the officers were working before they just classified everybody as a racist. And so then they ended up scrapping the whole program. So really we can't get reliable statistics on that because of that. Right, there's, as far as I know, um, while I was with the department before I left and there was no way that we were tracking that and it's not my understanding that anybody has been tracking that in any form or fashion. Okay, but it's not trying to cover up anything. It's because it's just, it's not, not practical to, to try to do that and, and be able to come up with meaningful statistics. Correct, because there's a lot of variables, again, that you have to take into consideration. All right, so then, and again, uh, these questions are uh, mostly about uh, St. Paul because we have people with connections uh, in St. Paul, and we don't have uh, the Minneapolis where we've been hearing a lot more uh, things going on. It's a completely different department, and we're not in a position to speak to that. And so the next question is, what is St. Paul Police's procedure to follow if a person resists arrest? So our policies and procedures are, you use the minimal amount of force necessary to restrain the person. If you're not able to restrain the person on your own, you back off and you call for backup. And then the two people will go in and try and restrain the person. Um, we have not, nor have we ever had any kind of chokehold maneuver that was authorized for St. Paul. We've, uh, the maneuvers we have are what we call pain compliance, and they're maneuvers that are very simple and easy for the officer to administer, and basically what happens is you put uh, pressure on specific nerve points that create pain, and it causes the person to comply. And, but yeah, we don't use choke holds or anything of that nature. So the goal is to use pain to get compliance, but pain in such a way that it shouldn't produce injury. Correct, it will not produce any injuries. Okay, all right. So do you feel that St. Paul police have a bias against black people and is there some justification for this? To be honest, I believe there there probably is some biases out there. I mean, everybody has a personal bias. And I know with police officers, some of the bias that I can account for um, from the officers that I know, it's only because of the statistics that are out there. Now, I don't have anything recent because there was nothing posted for you know, 2019 and obviously for 2020. So my statistics are from 2018 as the latest ones. But from those statistics, it breaks down um, which category of individuals we are more likely to run into any kind of violent resistance from. And Unfortunately, the black culture, we're 63% more likely to encounter an armed individual between the ages of 18 and 27, I believe it was, with someone who is black. Uh, for Asian, it was like 47%, and then for Hispanic, it was in 20% somewhere in the 20% range. And so when you have stats like that, you're going to be at a heightened level, level of awareness when dealing with somebody because you're more at risk. And part of the training, at least what we've done in St. Paul, is how do you stay aware of that risk 
without escalating the situation beyond what it needs to be. Okay. And Eric, if you have any uh, thoughts on any of this, feel free to jump in. The only thought I have is, I guess, to me, dealing with people of color as a police department, you're going to go through your own prejudice and biases, like she said, but what I paid attention to in the past two years that my daughter's been, you know, she went through the training and she became a police officer, was a safe summer night. And what I, what I admired about that was they went into areas in Frogtown and different communities that were predominantly uh, people of color and they reached out to that community and gave them free food and face painting and you know the dogs did shows and the horses and stuff so they they actually took the time to reach out to the community to get to know the community and and have the fear kind of subside and that's what got me to enjoy the police because I grew up here with a lot of racial discrimination and a lot of driving while black, while black I say and a lot of um, police um, brutality here but in St. Paul, me spending, I, I think I only missed one safe summer night, but me watching and getting involved and actually spending quality time with the police department and police officers and talking to them, I personally saw a different dynamic than what most people will see. Um, and, and they genuinely were reaching out and hanging out and talking and laughing and playing basketball. And I asked one of the cops there, when I first came, I said, you know, I'm a little uncomfortable. I have a problem with police officers. And he looked right in my eyes and he said something profound to me anyway. He said, I'm like you, man. I'm just trying to go home. I want to go home to my family. I want to go home to my wife and kids. And whatever I can do to make sure I go home to my wife and kids, that's what I'm going to do. And he goes, I don't have any biases against anybody. If you do anything wrong, I'm going to approach you, but I'm trying to go home. And after hearing him say that and watching the other officers literally getting down and rolling around on the grass and hanging out and laughing and, and playing ball and giving out bikes and helmets. And I said, you know what, it, we have to stop some of this narrative unless the effect that happened to me in Cottage Grove isn't every police officer. And it's not every police officer in Cottage Grove, I don't want to get that out there. But we got to stop with the narrative of all cops this, all cops that, all cops that. Um, there's a great number of great policemen and women out there, I see that but it took me to go out, out of my comfort zone, out of my comfort zone, and spend time with them and not be tense and talk to them, and then fall in love with the fact that what they're doing for the community is amazing, and to see, and, 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 and to see the community come out and embrace it, and, and see Johnny Howard, I'll, bring, I'll do a plug on Johnny Howard, to see and watch his connection with everybody that was around him, I love that, and I loved how people just lit up, and that's some of the fear so to me, I took it as if anybody got pulled over in St. Paul, after doing safe summer nights and hanging out, I can see the narrative being different. Hey man, weren't you at, what's going on? And, and it being a lot more calm. And I feel they need to do that in all the departments across Minnesota. That's what I feel. Okay. And if I could add to that, mm -hmm. I think people need to make contact with their police departments and find out what programs are out there. Because a lot of people really don't know a lot of police departments have pal and it's a program where we have officers that take kids from the inner city lower income and take them out on and do activities that they wouldn't normally get a chance to do i mean the number of kids that we've taken out fishing yeah. who have never gone fishing yeah. i mean you think, oh, we live in Minnesota, who hasn't gone fishing? <laughs> but you'd be surprised at how many kids have never been fishing. And so we take the kids out fishing, or we have the soccer leagues, or the baseball leagues, and things like that. It's the Police Athletic League. Right. And I mean, one of the things that I was doing before I retired was I was a supervisor for our mounted patrol. Now they've disbanded the mounted, so we don't have the horses anymore. but we had ho our horses patrolling in the different neighborhoods because nothing brings out people to come right. talk to the police than a horse strolling down your street. <laughs> and it's a great icebreaker. Right. You have to have that way to connect with the community and get them engaged to talk to the officers right. because all they see is a squad driving by. Yeah. 
and they don't connect with any of the officers and you have to have that connection if your community and your police are going to work together. Okay. All right, so how do I balance outrage for the death of George Floyd as well as anger that my former city was under attack? Does this need to be an either or situation? Am I not being supportive if I'm not accepting of burning and looting? And how can I reconcile my emotions surrounding both situations? Oh, I got this one. <laughs> no one is going to agree with burning anything down. Um, I don't agree with it. I've never agreed with it. There's a way to protest, and I'm going to get flack for this, and I'm okay with that. I'm not cool with rioting, looting, burning. I'm not okay with that. But I see the underlining of the anger there. And a lot of the things that happen in Minneapolis, there's other stages to that, I feel. There's other things, there's other narratives that we don't know the whole truth unless we are actually down there. Um, you have a right, you should be, you better be upset and, and in pain and, and tearing up and, and feeling bad for watching a man die on camera, okay? You should feel, you should feel angry. You should feel sad. You should feel upset. I hope so. Um, the way you subside that is now that all of this junk is done, the rioting, the burning down, what are you going to do now? That's my thing. Are you going to go help? When I went down to Minneapolis, I, I saw the film, and, and I'm one of those guys that I'm a 50-year-old black man, so for me it hit me differently because that's what I see a lot. I see a lot of dark black men. Men look like me. Women look like me my color, you know, dying. So for me, it's different. I take it extremely personal. Um, what I did, I sat in fear. I, I was angry. I was upset. I cried for a couple of days. And, and I told a friend of mine, I said, we're dealing with a pandemic. We're dealing with a mod. And now we got George Floyd. We haven't had time to come up from the, to breathe. It's like, okay, when can we breathe and relax? Well, a good friend of mine, Ruth Wilson, called me and said, I got a hundred and something sandwiches I need to get rid of. Where should we go? Okay, let's go to Minneapolis and do it. It was my first time there. It was maybe five, six days after it all happened. And I physically went down there, and my eyes opened up, and I went, wow. To physically see what happened is just insane. But then I turned and looked at everybody helping. That, that, was, that, that touched my heart. Because no matter what, I'm not going to ever say it's okay to burn or I don't agree with that, but it happened. So me handing out sandwiches and hanging out and paying attention and crying and praying and talking to people, my thing now is, okay, let's, let's rebuild it. It's time to rebuild. Let's, we, we understand, let the court system do what they got to do, okay, because we can't control that. We can't. Um, have the police departments work on some more diversity training. I don't know if that's Something that needs to happen in Minneapolis. I think St. Paul's doing an amazing job. They hired a ton of people of color. Their last, you know, when I, my daughter was on stage, there was a ton of people of color up there, which was beautiful to me. But um, go out and do something. So, yeah, you have a right to be angry. You have a right to be upset. Don't act on your anger, though. Take some time. Be empathetic. Um, if you are white and you have friends of color, check on them. How are you doing? How, how did, how, did, how did you handle that? How are you, are you okay? Are you, what's going on with you? Talk, check on it. But don't, don't go out and be crazy and angry about it. I have to turn off social media now because now that's all you're seeing. Oh, did you hear about this? Did you hear about that? Did you see that? Did you hear that? Guys, I'm still catching up. Give me a minute. This is in my hometown. This is some of the stuff that I've been doing. So I, you, you have a right. I, I, I feel I'm biblical about it. Don't act on your anger. Be upset, be angry. I, I was, I had to, I shut down for a couple of days. I didn't talk to anybody. I stayed in my house and hung out with my family and just literally sat in my room sometimes. It's like, I can't believe this is still going on. But don't, 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 I, you, yeah, have that. Have all the emotions, but calm down about, what am I going to do? Do something positive. That's my answer. Do something positive. Okay. And I'm, I'm along the same way. There, there's no reason you can't, you should be upset. Me as a police officer, when I was watching the video, I'm like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Your knee is on that man's carotid. What are you doing? And 
my first thought was when you find out that he had died, I'm like, you, you just, you literally killed a person and you set back every decent officer 100 years. And so now you have all these really good officers who are out there trying to make the world better, trying to do the right thing, trying to be that voice of calm for when people need it. Because people forget, 10 hours a day, we see the worst of society, day in and day out. Now, is that excusing his behavior? Absolutely not. But we get angry too. But you can't go out and start looting and burning. And the people who do those sort of things, those are opportunists. Those aren't protesters. Those aren't people who are upset. Yeah, they're mad, but now they're taking advantage of the situation. And they're saying, it's okay for us to do this because we're angry. No, it's not. People who go out looting and burning down other people's businesses, these people had nothing to do with what happened. You're an opportunist taking advantage of a situation to be a bad person. And that's not okay. So yes, be upset that what happened to George Floyd happened because it shouldn't have. But you don't have to agree with the looting and the burning. I absolutely disagree with that because these people are innocents. They have busted their butt their entire life to build up their own little business here, and now you just burnt it to the ground because you had a temper tantrum. That's not right. So, yeah, I'm in total agreement that you can do both. Okay. All right, thanks. All right, so what does the Bible say about racism in ourselves and in our culture? The one thing that I struggle with racism, um, and I'm going to try not to get teary-eyed this whole conversation, this thing we're doing, is if, if we're all made in God's image, how are you seeing color? Why are we seeing it? I get we're going we're gonna to know color. Let me, let, me, let me correct myself. Somebody can walk in, in this room right now, we're going to see their color. The first thing we're going to notice the color then their clothes and their shoes, I get all of that. But we're all made in God's image. And God frowns on that. We are to treat everybody the same. Black, white, doesn't matter. It's biblical. We know Christ didn't go out looking at anybody. He saw himself. And if we can't change that, this is where the church has to stand up. Churches all around Minnesota and everywhere should be diverse. That's why I love my church here at Light the Way. You can look around and see every color in the, st in the audience. It's a diverse church. It's a godly church. It's a, it's, a, it's a Jesus church because these are pe God's people and Jesus' people, right? So if we are to be Christians, men and women of God, then why are we looking at color? And I hear people, oh, you got to look at color. I get that, but if, if I'm made in his image, when I see you walk in the door, I see Christ. No matter what color you are, I still see Christ. And that's where we need to start being. And the church needs to take, you know, some hits on that, I think. We need to have, I mean, we're doing it here. We've been doing it here. But we, we need to address made in his image. What does that look like? Okay. Is there anything to add? I just, I agree with Eric in that we shouldn't be seeing color. Christ didn't see color. And... The one thing we were always told when we were growing up is God doesn't make junk. He doesn't. So there was no mistakes. Um, and people shouldn't see any other race as being less because God doesn't make junk. Yeah, and Jesus made a point of, uh, he reached out to the Samaritans that were they were the marginalized race in Israel. And, uh, and people went, even his disciples went, what are you doing? And, and, um, and this passage that always sticks out to me is uh, when he's traveling from north to south, it says he had to pass through Samaria. And, uh, and anyone at the time would go, what do you mean he had to? Yes, it was the most direct route, but he always went around Samaria. 
He's like, like going through, you know, avoiding the bad neighborhoods kind of thing. And, uh, but he had to because he knew someone was there that he wanted to connect with. And, and it made a difference, and, and it brought the message of his love there. And we got to get better at doing that. We have to be, we have to see everything through the eyes of Christ. We just have to. I love the parable of he without sin cast the first stone. Everybody sinned. We all do. But at the end of the day, we need to, we need to, we need to, we need to start looking at everybody as the same and saying, hey, man, how are you? How's it going? I will say I see a little bit more of that now. I'll see more of people like, hey, how's it going? And, hey, how you doing good? And I speak back now. I'll all start. Hey, man, how you doing today? And because we're at a time, I will say this real quick. Our eyes and ears are open now. Our eyes and this is why this is happening. Our eyes and ears are open now. So let's talk about it. Mm-hmm. All right. So I think we kind of already addressed this question, uh, but how should Christians think and act on issues of race and racism? It's kind of a similar question. Do you have anything to add on that? No, I, I, I think we've covered that, but I will add one short little story. Mm-hmm. You know, um, growing up, I grew up in Mendota Heights, and we were the only black family in the neighborhood. I was the only black kid in my school other than my brothers, and I never knew it. I never knew I was different. And that's how a community should be. Nobody should feel like they're different. We were never treated different. We were treated just like all the other kids. That's great. Be childlike. Kids don't see it. Mm -hmm. You'll never know what color a kid's friend is until you physically see. They'll talk about my granddaughter, talk about somebody at daycare for days. Sarah, 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 and then I'll see and be like, okay, whatever, but because we do it, but uh, childlike, that's why it's in the Bible. Just don't see people for who they are. Just look at the spirit that they got. Yeah, when all this happened, and I knew that that my kids would have to, um, you know, they were doing the distance learning, and they were going to be meeting up uh, with their friends online and stuff, and uh, they're, I mean, they're young enough, uh, seven, eight, and nine at the time, and, and or seven, eight, and ten, and, and they were, um, you know, that I knew that I had to have the conversation with them right. before they heard it from their friends. Right. And uh, so my wife and I, <laughs> we talked to them and, and we had to explain racism to them. Wow. And, and it, was, it was a completely alien concept. You know, we're trying to explain it to help them make sense of it, but it doesn't make sense to us. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and so, so, but I also realized that, um, and, I, and I think we'll, we'll get to that this m- a little more in a little while, that the way that we talk about it as a white family is different than the way that a family of color would talk to their kids about it. Um, and, and I recognize, and we'll, we'll talk a little bit about privilege, um, but it was just, it was kind of, it was really hitting me how it was, we, have to, we haven't had this conversation yet, and now we need to. Yeah. And, and it was a really hard conversation, but I thought, we actually had the choice of when to have that conversation. Mm-hmm. And that made, th- that was real eye-opening for me. Right. All right, so um, as Christians, how do we balance between the protect and serve duty of the police and the system and or individual officers who harm people of color? I think what needs to be done, obviously, is there has to be some changes to the way officers are disciplined. Um, We have uh, a step way of how you get disciplined. Starts with a oral reprimand, verbal, uh, written reprimand, um, a letter in your file, days off, days off without pay, Etc. But I think when certain conduct happens, there should be a standard of automatic firing that in 
it's hard to say that because there are times when the whole reason we have arbitration is to protect the officers from indiscriminate discipline. I can speak from experience. The reason why I left Hennepin County Sheriff's and came to St. Paul was because of how I was treated at Hennepin County. I was ready to quit law enforcement altogether because I was like, this is not what I want to do. This is not how I want to be treated by my coworkers. And then to come to St. Paul and have a completely different atmosphere because there would be people that I worked with at Hennepin County and you're looking at going, how do you still have a job? How can you possibly still be here? And then I come to St. Paul, and they have that level of discipline that they follow. And, but there's also protections for the police officer to prevent you from being indiscriminately targeted and disciplined. Um, and just to give an example, when I was at Hennepin County, we had an incident where uh, an officer was written up and given days off because of a comment he made. Supposedly, he was a white officer, made a comment that uh, an inmate that we had out that was black took offense to. Now, mind you, the comment he made, he made to me. And I did not find it offensive, but this gentleman did. And he turned around and he was like very apologetic. He says, that's not what I meant when I said that at all. And yet he ended up, I found out three weeks later that he had been severely disciplined. And I'm like, wait a minute, what happened? Well, they interviewed the people in the mod. They interviewed the gentleman and they interviewed the people that were in the mod, the holding cell that were behind two steel doors that couldn't have possibly heard anything, but they never interviewed the one person who said it. He said, made the comment too, which was me. And yet he got days off without pay. Those are what the arbitration is supposed to protect. That's how they're supposed to protect the officers from situations like that where they're unfairly disciplined. And then you see other instances where the arbitration comes in and people think that the arbitration is officers, other police, and it's like, no, these are outside agencies. And they determine, okay, nope, you can't fire this officer. And I think that's what needs to be looked at and in, you hear about people saying, okay, the review boards can't be police officers, it needs to be civilians. Well, civilians haven't the foggiest idea of what an officer goes through or how to respond to an incident or what they're supposed to or not supposed to do. So my suggestion for them, you want to be a civilian and judge officers, you go through the academy. You do all the training so you know what's right and what's wrong. We used to have a FATS program where it's a shoot, don't shoot scenario because people are like, they think you're John Wayne. Well, why didn't you just shoot that machete out of that man's hand? <laughs> that, you know, they're coming at you with a machete, but you're supposed to use harsh language and tell them to drop the machete. Guess what? They don't always listen. And so we used to have this program is shoot, don't shoot. And the officers, we still do it. And it's a program where you have the scenarios come up on a screen and you have a laser gun and you shoot or don't shoot. And people realize you have a split second to make that decision of whether you're going to shoot or not. And the number of people that shot the deaf guy that was just pulling out his ID or shot the kid that had the BB gun because it looks like a real one. 
all you see is the gun pointing at you. And people need to understand the difficulty in those decisions that you have to make. And they need to understand the policies and procedures of how you do effective arrests and that sort of thing so that they totally understand where the officers are coming from in the decisions that they make. Okay, so then do the officers then get the training in you know, the sort of don't shoot, don't shoot? I mean, we say that, that in, in those kind of scenarios that the officers do better than civilians in, uh, in making those decisions in those uh, simulations? Yeah, because you're, well, for one, you're, you're trained I mean, everybody, like you said, everybody thinks that we're John Wayne and we can shoot things out of people's hands or, or they say just shoot them in the leg. And they don't realize when you're in a situation that is um, of that nature, you know, your adrenaline shoots up here. Mm. And you have to maintain your full vision and you have to be able to think clearly and still make that split second decision. Mm -hmm. I ran into the same situation. We had a call, a uh, light-skinned black male or Latino male wearing a certain type of clothing. I spotted him, he's supposed to have a gun. I see him talking to somebody in a car. He lifts up his shirt, the gun's right there. He's walking back behind my vehicle. I jump out, draw my weapon, and I'm telling them, don't, I know you got a gun in the front. And the first thing he does is he grabs for the front of his shirt. Now, I had my finger on the trigger because I knew he had a gun. But there was just something in that young man. He turned out he was only 15. And I ended up tackling him instead. And I get him cuffed, and I roll him over, and I pull out the gun, and it's a BB gun. Wow. And trust me, he got the, don't you know, I almost. <laughs> and I got him home, and I told his parents what happened, and his mom was like, didn't I tell <laughs> you to get rid of that? And, uh, but that's the thing. I mean, there was just that one little inkling in my head that said something's not right, and I tackled him instead of pulling the trigger. But what had happened, what would have happened if it could have been somebody else that stopped him? Mm -hmm. And those are the decisions you have to make at a split second. And to this day, I still remember that incident, and it still bothers me how close I came to almost shooting a 15-year-old kid over a stupid BB gun, over a fake gun. But you, you pick it up and you look at it and you're feeling it and it feels real. It's got the weight of a real gun and it's not until you look at the barrel and you see that the hole is only this big and not a normal barrel and you realize it's a BB gun. So. Thanks for that. All right, so that was the last of the submitted questions. Uh, so in the time that we, that we have left, I just wanted to, I, uh, there have been all kinds of statements and things going around social media especially, and I gathered up a bunch of those, and I thought, let's take the time that we have left to answer some of those, to respond to some of those in a meaningful way that is really hard to do in, uh, you know, in a comment on social media or something like that. And so, uh, so the first one is, if you want to avoid trouble with the police, don't break the law. I've heard that one a couple of times. It's not about if you want to avoid the police. It's a different narrative. I was driving down the street, got pulled over by police, didn't ask for my ID, didn't do anything, got thrown in jail for four days. I've gotten pulled over several times. I've had them come into my home. Um, when they heard there was a fight and somebody had a gun of a white male there in my home, broke down the door, handcuffed me, put me, in, put me behind bars. It's not about breaking crime. Sometimes you do have police, not all, and I won't ever say all, you have police officers that have some type of racial chip on their shoulder and feel that they have the power and right to treat you any way that they can because of that. Um, 
they intentionally join the police force, in my opinion, to extenuate that power and use that against you for being a man or woman of color. Um, and when I hear people say that, to me, that's ignorance. It's, it's, I have not, I've, have I done things that I shouldn't have? Of course. Um, but I'd say seven out of 10 times I've been pulled over, mostly in Cottage Grove. I 100% innocent, nothing was wrong. Um, <clears throat> I got told by friends, change your car, do this. I don't, I don't need to change the car I drive. I don't need to fear for, fear for my life or feel like um, something's gonna happen because you have a chip. And I have stories upon stories about it. I don't have time to explain it, but you know, um, I almost died and got shot by a police because he pulled me over and I just kept saying, what did I do? I talk with my hands. Everybody that knows me, there's no threat there. And he had his hand on the holster and he gun clicked and had his hand on the gun and kept telling me to stand down. And I just said, what, what am I doing? What did I do? Why did you pull me over? That's all I wanted to know. He ended up grabbing me by the neck and pepper sprayed me, handcuffed me, threw me in the back of the car. And I'm in the back seat and I'm still, what did I do? <laughs> like, you can't, why are you just pulling me over? I'm on the freeway, you're, you're just pulling me over. So it, it's not breaking the law. I have seen those memes, I've heard them. That's ignorance to me. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a thing that we're not willing to deal with and face and that is there's some racism here in Minnesota. <laughs> and I've lived in the South, I live in other places, and some of the harsh, harshest racism I've ever endured has been here in Minnesota. And it's, it's, it's a conservative, but it's still in your face, but it's not as blunt. And when, we, when, it, when it comes out and you deal with it, it's always me on the other end going, what's that about? What did I do? Where's that fear coming from? I'm not looking this way, I'm not looking that way. You're just having a problem with the color of my skin in general. So it doesn't have to be you doing, doing a crime. It doesn't have to be you breaking the law. There's some police officers with a chip on their shoulder, with a racial chip on their shoulder. And she, you, know, you can contest to that, I'm sure. And yes, there is. I hate to admit it, but there are. And one of the things I know that we've done in St. Paul is Yes, everybody says, oh, you need more um, sensitivity training or you need more uh, training on discrimination and, and that sort of thing. And I think what agencies need is more training, like what we do in St. Paul, how to de-escalate yeah. when someone is agitated, clearly agitated. Officer could have easily de-escalated the situation by just saying, I pulled you over because I saw you weave off into the, across the solid white line two times. I'm here to check and make sure that you're not drinking or driving under the influence, et cetera, whatever. Explain why you're stopping him. De-escalate the situation. It's as simple as that. Okay. All right, so next one. White privilege, is, or white privilege doesn't exist. I think you kind of have to explain because some people actually do not understand what white privilege is. Okay. And so you, before you can have that conversation, you have to explain what the meaning is behind white privilege. And it goes both ways too because I was working nights and I pulled up, you know, I worked the Frogtown area so I would drive around the backside of the businesses to make sure and because nobody's going to break in through the front door, they're going to break in through the back door. So I come across a business, it's 1230 at night, and there's a station wagon backed up to a door. So of course I call it in and I see people coming out with stuff and I hands up, I got my gun out and everything and talking to the people and, and it turned out it was the business owner and he was very upset with me. And he's like, oh, well, black people, you, you don't think black people can own a business and, and that sort of thing? And I said, okay, um, sir, do you know me? Do we know each other? And he's like, well, no. Then how would I know you're the owner? And I would think you would be extremely happy that I'm taking the time to check the back of your business to make sure that the people bringing stuff out of your business are your employees and not people robbing you. And then the whole conversation changed, and it was just like, you're right, 
you know, I overreacted. And I said, I totally get it. I totally get it. Because of the concept that only white people can own businesses. Only white people are successful in life. And it's, no. Y you look at most of the businesses along university, along in the Frogtown area, they're minority owned. So y before you can have the discussion of white privilege, you have to explain what that means to some people because they don't, the concept is beyond them. They don't see it because they don't deal with, they don't confront the issue of racism and, and that on a regular basis. They don't see it. So to them, it doesn't exist. And I'll further that it is, I mean, a lot of what she said is correct. It's, it's something where a white person, what I tell them is when you walk into a store, do you, does your heart pump when a cop drives by, when you hear sirens? Do you feel um, threatened when you go certain places? Okay, have you walked into a place that's been predominantly black? Okay, so when I deal with, when I talk to people about white privilege, I said there's certain things that the color of your skin, you're not thinking about, you're not dealing with, and you're not addressing or whatever it is in your home, and that's fine because you have that privilege. As a black man, I do not. Every time I go somewhere, I'm looking around. Every time somebody stares at me or says a comment, I'm getting hyped up or upset, or okay, how did he mean that, how did that go? Anytime a police comes by, I'm okay, am I, I'm looking down, okay, am I driving fast, am I? So it's, it, what, what I feel with the definition of white privilege is, white people have to understand when it's not a rude, racial, vulgar word. It's saying that because of the color of your skin, there's certain things that you might not be going through. There's certain things that aren't gonna happen to you that have happened to me quite frequently. And, it, it's, and, and you need to respect that that's the difference. You're able to go somewhere and eat or, you know, nobody's asking you 52 questions or triple looking at your, you know, even with the George Floyd, I was somewhere and the lady was looking at my bill and it, it there's a lot of things that you can go through in your everyday life, Monday through Sunday, day in and day out, that you're just not thinking about it. And you go home, and like you even said, I had to have a talk with my kids about racism. I didn't ever have to do that before. So there's things that have been going on forever and ever and ever. In my 50 years of me being alive, I can tell you stories. Now that we have it out there, don't be offended by that word. Change it. What can I do? Maybe pay more attention. Man, I saw how they talked to that person of color. Excuse me, ma'am, I know him. That's not right. Don't do that. Speak about it. Talk about it. Talk to your family about it. Yeah, they're, they're, the world sees, I, I hate to do this, but the world does see color. And we are at this point in our lives where it's like that, and it's very heightened right now. So let's address it, so I'm glad you did that. I'm telling my friends to do that. Talk to your kids. Play close attention to what's going on. Have these conversations. Don't like, look at your privilege as I'm better. Look at it as, man, I haven't had to worry about that. But they have, so now I'm going to be more empathetic. There's that word again. I'm going to be more empathetic to know, man, I got it pretty good. I should be able to talk on that or speak up. Friends that are calling me now, that's the first thing I say. And I know it's in one of the questions. Speak up. Stand your ground. Talk. Have that conversation. If you know some relatives, have a conversation. Yeah, I remember one time you said, black people this. I'm calling you to address that. That, that was a little rude. That was a little dishonor. So it, it, the privilege isn't better, great. And you walk in, you just get handed millions of dollars. Everybody's like, oh, you're white, you're amazing. <laughs> the privilege is you're not worrying about things or dealing with things that we are, that I am. And it's nothing bad. It's just pay attention to it and address it. That's my so it's just a matter of having, there's things that we can take for granted as yes. that I can as a white person Absolutely. that that I just, I don't even think about. Right. Um, so when we talk to our kids about the police and you know, that something happened with the police and it was a racial thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, we always talk to our kids about the police, you know, that these are people that take care of us and protect us and you can trust them. And, and, and that conversation in a black family is different. Right. Um, 
Also, there's something that I heard from a similar forum that I was watching that I thought was really helpful uh, with this. Um, and they were talking about uh, that privilege isn't about guilt. Right. Um, you shouldn't feel bad for being white, but it's what you do with it is kind of what you're talking about. Um, and, and this person used the example of Superman. They said, you know, Superman doesn't mope around going, oh, I feel so guilty because I can, you know, punch through walls and, and zap lasers with my eyes and, and things like that. But what he does is he uses those things to help other people. Absolutely. And so we can use our privilege I like to help that narrative. I like that. <laughs> Never heard that. I've heard a lot of cool ones. I haven't heard that one. I, like well, that. I hadn't heard it either. It's not original <laughs> to me, but it, right. as, as a big fan of superheroes, it, it really yes. struck me. All right. So, um, okay, next question is, what about black on black crime? We just talked about this the other day. Um, that's a problem to me in general. I mentor all kids of color, um, white, black, whatever. Um, but my black kids, I have a different conversation with them. And I address that. Um, I say, you know, there's a lot of how I use it, my analogy, and I use it with my sons as well, is you have a bullseye target on your back. Don't add stripes to it. Don't add to it. Um, I'm not asking you to be, you know, completely, we should all raise our bar and do the best we can, but some of the crime and some of the things that are happening with the black on black is, is something that society will use as we're monsters, we're animals, we're bad people, we're criminals. Look at how we act. And we have to address that as a community, which I feel we are. I know I am. I'm a father. I, I, I have full custody. I, I got full, full physical legal custody of my kids. Um, I was one of the first males that had done that here in the state, and I've been a father figure and a father forever. And I'm fathering any kid that is fatherless as much as I can. That's why I work for Treehouse. And, and, and that narrative does need to change. But sometimes, I mean, if I can speak honestly on it, sometimes the black on black crime is because there's no, nobody repercussions that. We're angry or upset, we're fighting with each other, and really nobody's addressing that. And I, can, and I can have an argument with my brother and fight him and all that, and things can happen with each other, and nobody's really addressing that, so we can get away with that because we're angry about other things. We're angry about where we are or what's going on. And I've seen that over the years. Um, so it's, it's, it's a bad problem. It's a problem that we shouldn't constantly bring up to, to demoralize black men and say, hey, man, they, the blacks are always fighting each other. Well, look at them. They're killing themselves, blah, blah, blah. It should be, well, what do we do to help that situation as well? Doing all of these things that were going on, like I said, the pandemic and, and, and Ahmad and George Floyd, people were still like, well, in Chicago, there was 500 blacks that, and I'm going, man, why are we talking about that? So what are you going to do to change some of that narrative? Um, no matter what's going on in our community, a good friend of mine goes down to Minneapolis all the time, and he makes a ton of free food all the time and he's giving out free food and he's talking to people and he's hanging out and, and he's, a, he's, a, he's a black man that owns his own business and does you know a lot of school, cool stuff for the community. Do that. Spend time. I do it. Spend quality time and teach, hey, I can't help a lot over here because they're older and they're set in their ways but I'm going to take these young kids and these teenagers and these young adults and I'm going to change that narrative to say quit hating yourself love yourself you are made in god's image look in the mirror and don't see your color as some type of defense or anger to take it out on your brethren but to look in the mirror and go okay i'm god's son i'm a king i'm a queen and i'm gonna do the best i can it's 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 the things that are happening in 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 the predominantly black areas that are lower income and all that is devastating to me but we gotta switch it we gotta fix it St. Paul's doing that. I, they, they are, I feel. They're coming in. They're hanging out. They're, they're, they're looking at what's going on, and they're saying, hey, we got programs. So I feel that's kind of a cop-out to me. Oh, black on black crime. Yeah, I get it, man. We can talk about a lot of stuff. But at the end of the day, what are we going to do to fix things and be empathetic? Okay. Anything to add? No, I, I totally agree. I think it needs to, the conversation needs to start at home and kids need to be told and get them to realize and believe in their own self-worth. 
Okay. All right. So one more question uh, that that I found or expression that I keep seeing is I don't see color, and I think we've we've talked about that a little bit, but maybe you'd like to expand on that. I mean, we shouldn't see color. We do. Um, we can't act silly about it. We do see color. But if we, if we take the, the principles of the Bible and be childlike and we see people as made in God's image, then color should be the third, fourth thing we see. Like, I'll use me. I'm a shoe nut. I love shoes. And I'm not just saying this on this panel. It's the truth. The first thing I'm going to do if people walk in, I might glance at color, but I'm going to check out the shoes. What, what's, what, the, what kind of shoes this guy want? Oh, those are some good kicks. I like those. Where did you get those? So we have to start doing like that, like my granddaughter who talks about people at school all the time and you have no idea until you get there to see. So to say I don't see color, no, see color, address color, but take it as they're just like me. They're, they're human, they're made in God's image, they're beautiful. I think intermixing and all that is just gorgeous. And I always make fun of people. I say, y'all got a problem with this, but when God put black and white together, he's some of, those are the most beautiful kids I've ever seen in my life. So we have to embrace beauty. God knew what he was doing. We have free will. I get it. But at the end of the day, let's start addressing, even myself and my own culture, me, stop addressing that white man. A friend of mine said, we're doing, we do a diversity meeting here on Wednesday nights. Come and check it out, please. Every Wednesday night's here in our parking, our parking lot at 630. And we talk about race in the community and all that. And a, a good friend of mine said, why do I say my black friend Eric, my white friend Dale, my black friend Valerie? Why don't I just say my friend? And then when the person meets them, oh, okay. So even I'm doing that now. I'm like, hey, that's a good point. Let's work on not seeing. We're going to see color, and I get it. And I don't want to have people texting me after this. And You can always see color. I get it. But let's work on just seeing a human being and seeing God and seeing God's people and seeing the beauty. And then, hey, how are you doing? Let's help. I've had people say hi to me before at Walmart. Hey, how you doing, buddy? And I'm not lying. Sometimes I don't even know what color they are. I'll be walking and I'm like, hey, buddy, what's up? I don't know. Is he white? But I don't know. So let's start getting better at just not paying attention to that and helping. Where do you need help? My empathy is, you know, I love you. Let's, let's figure it out. Let's stoop. Let's just help out the best we can. Okay. Anything you add? No, I think he said it perfectly well. It's just that, yeah, we see color, but I think, again, it's something that's learned in the home. And instead of looking at somebody's color, you need to look at that person's personality or their soul. And decide, okay, is this person someone I'd like to get to know because they're a beautiful person? Not because some of us tan better than the rest of you, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but like I said, growing up, I, it wasn't until I hit college wow. that I was treated differently. And to my surprise, it was from black people who were darker skinned than me. And they saw my color as not fitting in because my skin was too light and my hair was straight. And I was just kind of flabbergasted. I'm like, well, what difference does that make? I, I'm still human. Last time I checked, mm -hmm. that's what God made was a human. And that's what everybody should be looking at. Not that, oh, this is a black person, this is a Hispanic or Latino person. That's a human, that's a human, that's a human. And that's how we should look at each other. Okay. I'm going to add real quick because it just hit me as we were sitting here. I had a friend of mine that was, I felt he's a little racist, uh, a little prejudiced, whatever. And one day he, we got into it about some things. And he's like, I got black friends. And that's what he said to me. And I stopped and I thought about it. I looked him right in the eyes and I said, do you count how many you have? Because I don't. I don't count how many white friends I have, Mexican friends, Latino friends, black friends. I've never in my life sat and went, okay, let me look at my phone list. Up, oh, yep, there's one, two, I'm up to six, honey. I've never done that. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it offended me and it made me go, okay, see, if you're, if you're looking at how many I have, then there's a problem. So even before all of this junk happened, I was trying to get better at working on, I'm not counting who I know and who, how many this, that, and the other. I'm just friends with good people. That's a good guy. He's a, you know what I mean? 
So along that line um, with color, but there's also culture, right? Absolutely. Right, and so, um, so it's not that, you know, with this whole discussion of, of seeing color, we can also appreciate cultures. And, and that we don't all have to have the same culture. There's different cultures have different foods, different ways of mm -hmm. talking and acting and, and all that kind of stuff. And so it's not that we have to get rid of our differences, but that we can celebrate those differences and, and appreciate that from others. Absolutely. This, um, <laughs> this reminds me of uh, something that happened with our family. And again, this is, this is from our white perspective. Um, when I was going to seminary down in St. Louis and our oldest daughter was little at the time and um, and we're in the parking lot, and, uh, and she, she says, hey, that girl over there has brown skin, and I have white skin. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and we're kind of like, shh, shh. Oh. You know? <laughs> <I'll tell you. laughs> but, but she wasn't saying it as a, like a prejudice thing. No. It was like, oh, huh, cool, you know. <laughs> and, and so she was just appreciating the differences, the, the variety, and but we were, you know, we were so nervous about it. We thought, oh, someone, and, and we knew that's where she was coming from. Right. But, but we were nervous about, you know, someone hearing it and, and taking it the wrong way and, right. you know, something like that. And, and, and one more story from something that happened with us um, as uh, we were foster parenting. Yeah. And, um, and we had a, um, a girl who was staying with us for a while who was Filipino. Yeah. And... Um, and it was, it was getting to the point where it was looking like we might end up adopting her. And, um, and the, the caseworker said, okay, you know, is, how would you feel about that? And we said, you know what, if, if that's what she needs, if she needs a family and things can't work out with her, uh, with her birth family, then absolutely, we would take her in and uh, she would be our daughter. And they said, okay, so because she's Filipino, you have to talk to your kids and ask them if that would be okay wow. to adopt someone who's Filipino. Wow. And we said, no, we don't have to have that conversation because <laughs> she's been living with us for several months now and they've never treated her any differently. Wow. The only difference is that she brought some really cool foods um, that, that we like and, you know, and, and we enjoy that. And you know, otherwise it really, there hasn't even, hasn't been noticeable. And, and uh, and they said, you have to have, legally, you have to have that conversation with, with them. And, and so we said, all right. And uh, so we sat them down and, and we said, well, how would you guys feel of if, if it comes down to it, it um, uh, if we adopted her? And, and, uh, and they went, yeah, 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 that'd be great. You know, absolutely. And, and we said, okay. Now, we were told that we have to ask you this question. <laughs> we said, said, how would you feel, I mean, does it make a difference that she's Filipino? Mm -hmm. And the look they gave us was, it was accusation. Right. It was like, <laughs> how dare you ask us that question? Right. What kind of a question is that? It was, it, was like, it was like we had said, you know, does it make a difference that, you know, that she's five foot four and not five foot five? You know, right, <laughs> it was right, just right. like, what? It was like, <laughs> look, they told us we had to ask you. you know? Wow, that's cool. Very cool. So, um, all right. So, as Christians, as we close, where do we go from here? Well, I think as Christians, um, we have to be the ones to take the initiative to have the conversations and point out our own. We can't be offended when somebody points out our own prejudices that we may have, that we don't realize we have. And one of the things that we did in St. Paul as our training is we saw they, they made us sit down and watch the movie Zootopia. Mm -hmm. And what it was about was underlying prejudices that we all have, but we don't realize we have. And then we had a discussion and we were like, okay, did, what did you get out of the movie? Of course, you got the people that were like, oh, you know, it's a cartoon. We watch with the kids, blah, blah, blah. And it's like, no, you missed the point. We all have underlying prejudices. How do we deal with that? How do we get over that? How do we face those? 
And that's the conversation as Christians we have to have with each other to help each other get past those personal biases. And I'll give you a quick example. Uh, everybody knows me. I'm a travel nut. I'm in Australia at a resort. And the gal behind the counter won't wait on me because I look like an Aborigine. And the European culture and the Aborigine culture there are still having some conflict. Now she's working the front desk. And this was part of a women's police conference and sure enough my, my uh, roommate was a little retired gal from um, Davenport, Iowa and she was a little spitfire, Margaret. She blew a gasket and she demanded the manager, et cetera, and the manager came out, was very apologetic, and I said, look, I understand there's still, you know, issues between the two cultures, but if you're gonna have somebody work in the front desk where you're dealing with people from around the world, they have to keep their personal biases in check. If they're gonna be dealing with the general public, you have to keep your bias in check. You may not be able to control that bias, and you may not be able to eliminate it, but you have to learn to keep it in check. Yeah, that, that's a really good point, all right? That everybody has biases, no matter who you are. Mm -hmm. And um, I know that there are, you know, there are narratives that pop into my head in different situations where I have to consciously say, no, that's wrong. Mm -hmm. that, uh, that I have to combat my subconscious biases that, that pop up that I recognize and say, no, 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 that's wrong. Ignore that or reject that. And um, because it comes, what it comes down to is you can't control what pops into your head. You can control what you do with it. Absolutely. Exactly. Right. And my, um, oh, go ahead. my thing I was going to say about it real quickly is uh, um, what I'm telling people right now is repent, renew, and rebuild. Repent of your your past, repent of some of your prejudice, repent of some of the things you might have said, repent of some of the things you might have allowed being said in front of you, repent about it, and then renew your mind. Educate yourself, read books, watch movies, however you need to do it, renew your mind about what's really going on right now, and then rebuild, and that's rebuild relationships, rebuild friendships, help rebuild Minneapolis, and last is empathize, be empathetic. Just, just literally stop and empathize if that was me how would I feel if that was me a lot of this George Floyd thing was going on but some of the things that people weren't saying a, a, a lot of is I'm like I'm crying out for his daughter I'm crying out for his mom I mean you know so we have to be man if that would have happened to me or that would happen you know my daughter said that at one of our community outreach we have for the uh, city of St. Cottage Grove she said my dad's George Floyd like and that hit me too I was like man right so repent, renew, and rebuild and empathize. Just don't be afraid to ask those questions because everybody's eyes and ears are open now, but empathize with other cultures, definitely. Yeah, yeah, and, it, and just as we, uh, as we look at people, and, and this has been said over and over again, but to, to look at people and recognize, um, you know, to, to look from their perspective to, and to see them as people, to see them foremost as people just like you, and um, and to not not see them as um, as as some any anything less than that um, as far as uh, you're a pawn in 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 uh, because of some goal that you have and you're going to use them to to reach a goal or or they're getting in your way of of something or whatever but if you first recognize them as people and. And we talked about how God created us, and, and so we're all of infinite value. Jesus paid for us on the cross. And so when we recognize that about ourselves and we recognize that about others, then that just changes how we deal with people, with everyone. All right. Well, I really appreciate you both uh, helping out with this and, and offering your viewpoint. I know it's a viewpoint that I can't give. And so um, I, I wanted to, to give an opportunity to, to share some some viewpoints that are in some ways similar, but in other ways different from a lot of what we've been hearing um, from different directions. And I hope this has been helpful. Hope this has shed some um, some light, uh, more than heat. And um, 
and, and I pray that, um, that those who are, are watching would, would benefit from this and uh, be able to find uh, some peace and some, uh, just an increased awareness and an increased love uh, toward everyone that you encounter. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.